So welcome to another edition of All Things Aviation. My name is Vince Mickens, and we have another great show. Uh, this will be our fourth. Uh, and so we're, we're a month in with this new initiative with the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation. Uh, a couple of acknowledgments. Uh, the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation, uh, the, the president is Tracy Forrest. Uh, the chairman of the board is Michael Horn. And I also know the other board, 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 board members are watching. I'm hearing a really weird sound. sound. I'm actually, actually getting a little bit of feedback. Anyhow, so I'll just turn my volume down a little bit and figure out what's going on with that. Um, but so welcome to the show. We the the whole point of this initiatives is initiative is to talk with young aviation professionals like the two young gentlemen we have on today uh, about their career, their career path, uh, their goals uh, in aviation, but also to, to talk to them about options that are out there. So every week we have we we definitely will probably have a pilot, but we also have uh, people from other aspects of the industry to talk about their perspective um and and how they got to where they are because we have all found in our conversations that no matter uh what our our passion and our goals are in aviation usually it's a path that we didn't totally anticipate um even if we had it kind of set in our mind in the early stages we find that we zig and we zag and all of those kind of things so you know this is a a, a great uh platform for providing that opportunity. And plus we have a lot of young people that are either uh, high school or uh, middle school age that are thinking about aviation and, and wanna know more about the industry and, and also again, the, the opportunity and the possibilities. So those are some of the things that, that we actually uh, are looking at. Uh, as you can probably see uh, on your screen that we have a, a great set of guests again and I'm going to grab my, there we go. I'm gonna grab my information here then. And uh, I, I was just talking about this before when we were, <laughs> sometimes when I go live, everything wants to do its own thing, um, uh, not, in accordance with the way I originally set it up. And that's what it's doing right now. Okay, so now that I've gotten things back in order, let me go ahead and move forward with trying to make this look as smooth as possible. Kind of like, um, you know, every approach to the runway can always have a little bit of a surprise for you. Okay, so first I'll introduce the, the two young gentlemen that are on the uh, broadcast with us today. Uh, first I'll introduce Andreas Ladvinkinenka, I knew I was going to do that, Ladvinkinenka. Uh, Andreas is a 19, 2019 graduate last year from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Prescott. Uh, and we'll learn a little bit more about what he's been doing since then and, and what his goals are uh, in aviation. And then we also have Jacob Cook, who just graduated. Uh, he's from the Daytona Beach campus of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. It's important to point out that both of them are recipients of the Bob Hoover Presidential Scholarship, uh, and they, uh, which was provided on behalf of the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation, along with the Citation Jet Pilots Association. For those of you who don't know, the Citation Jet Pilots Association, they're a group of uh, citation owners, citation jet owners, uh, who, who get together regularly to discuss safety and new features about the aircraft, et cetera, and so forth. And it's, it's uh, almost a bit of a club, uh, as are with most of the aircraft that are manufactured. Some of the other manufacturers have the same thing. We call them type clubs. Uh, and it's, it's a great opportunity for them to network and exchange uh, ideas and thoughts of what's going on and that type of thing. So um, it's great to have these guys and, and we'll, we'll hear more about their backgrounds and, and their goals. As far as our distinguished panel of guests, we have Young Park. She's a chief executive officer of First Chime, which is a private aviation, a corporate aviation catering company. Uh, she's had an interesting path to get there and um, she didn't go to culinary school. So I uh, wanna hear more about what she did and how she got to where she is now and, and, uh, and what she has to share with us. 
we uh we have nancy viteri i think i got that right <laughs> did i get it right nancy yes yeah. okay good. <laughs> she is lead pilot in command uh for executive jet management uh executive jet management is an aircraft management company that has part 91 operations um and uh provide other services with related relationship to uh private and corporate flying uh, and then we have a guest who we had on earlier uh, in uh, July, Tamara Collum. Uh, we brought Tamara back because Tamara has this combined experience that, uh, you know, I, we think is can be very informative in terms of what she did. So she was a flight attendant on Air Force One. And she has a million stories she could share, but then she'd have to shoot you. So, um but she she was a, she did that for a number of years and she actually retired uh, as an Air Force Master Sergeant, which is impressive in itself. She's now a contract uh, corporate flight attendant, but she also is a certified international business and etiquette consultant and a certified and is certified in crew resource management. So welcome everybody to the program. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. So it's great to have everybody here today. And we want to uh, do what we've done on previous shows, and that is really see if we can help uh, Jacob and Andreas out uh, with their direction that they wanted to go in their careers. We were talking a little bit before the broadcast. Uh, and Andreas, you had uh, some uh, thoughts uh, and questions about what you're going to be doing. What, could you first tell us a little bit about your school background and what you're currently doing? So um, very nice to be on the show and I'm very uh, honored to be invited to be part of uh, one of the guests. Um, so my background is um, I started going to Embry-Riddle in Prescott 2016. I didn't have any flight experience at all, came in at zero hours. Um, I worked my way through the college um, I was a little bit ahead of my credits. I should have graduated this year, but I graduated a little earlier. Um, once I finished school, I had my uh, commercial multi. So commercial license, instrument rating, and then uh, also fly multi-engine airplanes. And then uh, afterwards I decided to build some hours. Um, the best route would be to become a certified flight instructor. So I went back home to Reno, Nevada, where I uh, worked on my uh, flight instructor certificate. And then uh, COVID-19 hit and that kind of delayed some things. So uh, I was supposed to finish around April, but it happened in June instead, which I'm still grateful for to even have the certificate. And now I've uh, just been hired at Embry-Riddle and Prescott to be a instructor pilot. So I'll be teaching new students um, for right now, just private students. And I'm looking forward to building some hours teaching students how to fly and the ultimate goal is just to get into the airlines that i'm also in a cadet program myself with sky west so um working with them to hopefully get a job there eventually good did you have a, a, a question for uh any of our guests yes yeah, so my first question is um kind of relating to the whole coronavirus time um since the aviation industry goes up and down all the time um with 9 11 and the recession um in the 2000s what would you just kind of open floor to anyone what would you recommend for us young aviators um, going into the industry how to deal with these crises that happen throughout our lifetime and how to keep yourself composed without thinking everything's just falling beneath your feet? Well, if I might answer that uh, first, Andres, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, this is Nancy. Um, I've uh, been fortunate to be in the aviation industry a long time and I've had a lot of ups and downs in my personal career. Um, I was in the military for 20 years and uh, in the last 16 years, I've been a corporate pilot and I've been through a significant number of jobs as a corporate pilot, largely due to um, flight departments closing, unrelated to some of the events uh, you spoke about, um, an owner selling an airplane, those kinds of things. And I found myself on many occasions having to pivot and come up with a new uh, plan. And um, interestingly enough, it always seems to work out. You always meet someone who's out there to help you on your uh, journey. And, um, you know, particularly in this time, um, 
I think the thing that most of us can do if flying is down uh, a little bit and you're not getting out there is to um, stay as current as you can, staying in the books. Uh, I'm personally flying a Challenger 300 right now and I, I stay in the books and I read things and I keep up on my limits, stations and those type of thing. And, um, you know, also as pilots, we all have to stay in shape and keep our medicals. So I'm a swimmer and no pools are open right now, but I'm out there walking and riding my bike. And um, I'm a member of NBAA and AOPA. And um, particularly NBAA has, uh, much like today, I, I was unaware of the uh, Hoover uh, Foundation webinars, but everyone's doing great webinars. I've been on about 15 of the NBAA webinars since they started and a variety of current topics and whatnot. So, um, you know, just keeping in the game and keeping yourself ready because it, it, it'll come back. It, it always has and it will. Yeah, I think that's great advice that you're giving about uh, staying in the game and being involved in a lot of things. Being a member, uh, and, and you can have a, a student membership for MBAA as well as for AOPA. And both of those organizations provide a lot of information of what's going on in the industry, what's pertinent, what's important for your career. Uh, and it's, it's just good to be in the know. At the same time, we've talked about it before, it's, it's a really good thing to go to as many events as you possibly can. We've had some of the previous scholarship winners talk about how they went to Oshkosh for the first time, or they went to an MBAA uh, convention for the first time, uh, and how much they learned from that. So yes, absolutely. Um, Nancy, while we have you, you've had quite the background. I know I always say that but, because all of you guys have, but you know, every time I, I get a chance to, to meet somebody like yourself and learn more about your background, I'm just amazed at all of the things that you've done. Can you give us a quick synopsis of, of uh, what you've done in terms of your aviation career? How did you get started? Oh, sure, absolutely, Vince. Um, I started out, um, as I mentioned yesterday, we were doing a little chatting. Uh, that my father worked for Grumman on Long Island and that's where I grew up. And um, so I was always around aviation, but did not know that I could be a pilot. It just wasn't one of those things that popped up, but um, he worked on the lunar module program and the F-14 program. So we were always around aviation. And I planned to study um, chemical engineering in college. And a couple of the schools I applied to had Air Force ROTC. And I thought that might be a great way to go to college, you know, to serve in the military. We were a big military family as well. And I went to Manhattan College in uh, New York City, uh, went on an Air Force ROTC uh, scholarship for engineering. Uh, but then uh, I, I received a pilot slot to go to pilot training in the Air Force. And um, I didn't know that it was an option for me. And I decided it'd be a lot of fun and I would do it. And uh, it turned out to be the greatest thing, uh, probably the best decision I've made in my life. Um, I did not plan to stay in the military for 20 years, but I was having so much fun. I stayed in, I flew uh, KC-135s and I flew out of Andrews Air Force Base where Tamara was as well, uh, flying Gulfstream aircraft. And then um, after retiring after 20 years, I uh, moved on to be a corporate pilot and I've flown in uh, many corporate flight operations, um, mostly at Dulles Airport. And uh, I've just had a uh, great time uh, flying around the world and working with the great people that we have uh, in the aviation industry. Yeah, some people automatically think that if you're in the military, that you're going to probably transition to the airlines. And, and in many cases, that's true. But you just showed a track where you went from flying a KC-130 uh, Hercules to, uh, to switching to golf streams which then led to you flying in corporate aviation after you got out. Would you agree that that kind of, that path wasn't something you expected, but went that direction anyhow? Oh, absolutely. And I have to make one correction, Vince. I was in the Air Force, so it was a KC-135 Stratotanker, which Sorry. is similar to the That's okay. I would have loved Busted. to fly the 130 version as well. But uh, yes, you know, uh, getting to fly a golf stream in the Air Force um, was wonderful. And uh, since we did our training uh, with fellow business pilots, we get some exposure to uh, the business aviation world. So uh, there's, there's a great opportunity there to move into business aviation versus necessarily going to the airlines. So um, it, was, it was great flying golf streams. It was, it was a terrific mission and uh, had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, Jacob, you've, um, we were talking to you earlier and you're on a track for for flying, but you have also been looking at other options because of COVID-19 and that type of thing. 
Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing and, and what you're thinking of? Yes, sir. Yep. So I recently graduated in May uh, with all my flight ratings. Uh, I was supposed to be ready to be flight instructing at school, but unfortunately, because of the COVID pandemic, I haven't quite been able to start teaching or get a job flight instructing. Uh, so I'm actually home back in New York and I'm looking at, uh, I'm going to stay current on my flying, but I'm also going to try to diversify my background and have a little bit of a backup plan. So I'm actually looking to working with my dad and learning a little bit about electrical and kind of mechanical side of almost a little bit of engineering just to diversify and have something on my resume so if flying doesn't work out someday i lose my medical i uh, have something to fall back on just another realm of knowledge yep uh, and you had a question also for um one of our guests yeah uh any could any can answer so obviously you know no one expected any of this to happen back in march um and I had a pretty set schedule uh, in my head for the past four years of be a flight, get my flight instructor ratings before graduation, which I did, and then immediately start working at school, stay at school while flight instructing at Embry Riddle for a year or two, however long it takes to get to a thousand hours, and then you're off to the regional. That's pretty much the typical Embry Riddle pilot track that they do. And I was on track, and then the pandemic hit. And now I'm kind of in this haze of confusion and not sure of what's gonna happen or my plans are obviously changing. Um, and I know Nancy specifically started with a chemical engineering degree and then has this awesome decorated flying career. So I'm just wondering along the way of how, how did you adapt to the change and kind of see the bright side and staying motivated on your goals, but your goals are changing and that's just a hard time. So I'm just looking for any advice or what you did and obviously it worked out for you. So congratulations. Nancy. Well, oh. Oh, go ahead. Nancy, go. Uh, okay, I know the uh, other ladies have a lot to add to and probably similar type stories. Um, you know, as I said, um, all you can do is, um, you know, keep yourself ready because the opportunities will be there. Um, one of my flight departments, uh, which I loved flying in, had been around for 84 years was one of the departments that closed unexpectedly after I'd been there a year and a half. And um, I really thought it was gonna last forever, which was probably my first mistake because nothing, you know, things change. But um, I, I, I went and became a contract pilot, similar to uh, Tamara's doing some contract flying now, and we've uh, flown together. Um, I did some uh, safety management work because I also had that skill set from prior jobs. So exactly what you're planning is wonderful. Um, we're all going to have to do what we have to do if we're laid off or we're furloughed or, uh, you know, looking for our first big opportunity. But particularly for you guys, um, your passion for aviation is not going to go away. So you've, you've got to keep that up. And I know a lot of people who um, have full time jobs, but do their um, instructor flying on the weekends. So that'd be one way you could keep it up if you start doing something else. But um, don't don't give up your dreams. Um, it, you know, just keep pursuing it. And I think that that'll get you where you need to be. Thank you. Well, I'd like to chime in real quick, if I may. Um, I personally have been dealing with COVID-19 since last December. Before I opened a company in the U.S., I had a catering company in Korea. And since December, I've seen that the you know, a drastic uh, reduce amount of uh, flight uh, aircraft movements and or catering orders and et cetera, et cetera. And I spent many days, many nights in panic mode. I, I was afraid of what would happen, that uncertainty and the confusion and the disappointment that just, it, it just hit you all at once. And now I look back, I think the toughest time for me was between three to six months. So if you've been dealing with uh, COVID-19 um, since, March or April now is probably the hardest time for you and this job uh, being a crew member it gets in your blood it, it just doesn't go away so what I would like to recommend is to stay close to your mentors um, I think that is extremely important that you you get you don't get misguided you you don't get consumed by your own fear or insecurities just you know like Nancy and everybody's recommending there's a lot of great webinars keep yourself in loop 
uh, and it takes a deliberate effort for you to be a part of the game. And I think, uh, one, and then it gets a little easier. You, you will get to, you get to term, uh, you come to terms with it and then you will find your peace. And then from that point, what I did was I set a very short term goal, very short, short term goal. So that when, when it's get, when it gets achieved, you feel some kind of achievement and start feeling positive. And that, that helped me to get through this time. I, I, they all have, and I always agree. Um, I always tell the story when I was looking to get out of the Air Force at 10 years, 9-11 happened. And I was like, well, I know where, what I'm doing now. And I always say one door closes, 10 open, but aviation, it's in your blood. And you just go through all those doors and you get to your point. Keep your goals there and keep them set. But there's other options that, you know, there's fire, flying, like firefighting, you know, what is it, banner towing? I mean, there's so many options, especially where you're at. Now, just keep talking to everyone. Ask questions with everyone you talk to. Yeah, that's a great point. There are a lot of, uh, of different types of flying that can be done. Uh, obviously, flight instructing is the most obvious, but the ones you just named as an example, uh, Tamara, are also uh, great for people to keep in mind. You know, the common denominator of question that we get often, though, and, and maybe any of you can expand on that for these two young gentlemen, uh, and one of them alluded to it a little bit earlier, is they're like, okay, you've, you've done what you've done and you've been successful with it and everything. I'm at the very beginning stages of this. And now I've been thrown, a, a wrench has been thrown in it with the, the situation with COVID-19. You know, what are the things that, that these young gentlemen can be doing actively, even with the restriction that is currently taking place to further their career? Nancy, you did touch on it about reading publications. And I, I'd like to mention one, Aviation International News, AIN, is a really great publication to know what's going on in the industry. Uh, Obviously, if you're if you want to expand it into things like aerospace, um, then Aviation Week and technology is also really good too. But any of those publications are are key to to staying up with what's going on. And there's a lot of different ways to access that information. And as a student or, or fresh out of college, they they offer special. You know, sometimes they're free or sometimes it's a discount. I know Aviation International, you can get it for free online. All you have to do is register with them. So things like that, uh, I think, are really key. And I can help you if it makes you feel better. I've not flown since March 16th because most of my accounts have, they're not flying right now or they're not using contracts. And a lot of them said, we're not going to use any contract fly attendance till next year. So I've been focusing on the training side of it because my passion is training and mentorship. But I'm also been focusing on, you know, how can I improve within myself but, and share with others to get through it. So definitely I keep up social media. It's not always my favorite avenue, but there are a lot of um, aviation, uh, what is it? Aviation hiring or people out there communicating what's going on or their jobs available on there and so I read up on that to just keep track of whatever other people are doing and then with my friends I created a cooking with letters when COVID started because I'm home and all of a sudden I'm having to cook food because I'm not going out to eat and it kept us connected and just improve on my techniques but on a health check for everybody else too so I just creative thinking trying to find ways and meet people and network still in, amongst COVID. Yeah, I think uh, talking amongst you and uh, your friends and your peers, they can be another great um, outlet for you to not only exchange the the current affairs and informations, but to support each other. Just you know, just to unload and. Uh, share the similar feelings you may have at this time. Uh, sometimes just just to let it out and just talk to your friends, it helps a lot. I do agree with you, Tamara. Young, give us a day in the life of uh, catering. What, what, how does your how does that start with with from you when you get the order, um, say for a corporate flight, uh, and and how do you proceed from there? 
Well, usually it, it has changed a little bit. Usually uh, most clientele, they do already, they already know what they would like and our job is to make it happen. So I, we do, a lot of catering companies have menu, but there's more of a, a reference. Uh, these are available, but the clients are uh, almost hundred times they will order what they will like. So being Does able- Does that vary a lot? Huh? Does it vary a lot, their order or-, or their Oh certain- yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we'll have uh, orders that comes in with the recipe because they would like you to make that from scratch. And they will I send have- you a recipe? Oh yeah. And the picture, like a uh, picture of the food. I, one time I had um, oh a client, uh, one time I had a client who asked for African sauce. I've never heard of it. I don't know what it is, but I had to make it. So it, it, it can be very challenging if you're coming from the restaurant business or some kind of uh, established eating facilities where they're okay, this is what was available and that's all you get. It, it is very different, but it, it's fun. It's fun. It, you get to expand your knowledge. So usually they will place an order via email or text and then... Um, they would proceed and they will let us know what time it, they would like it to be delivered. Um, if there's any food allergies or any special requests like dietary restrictions. So we create a meal just for that flight. But lately, ever since the COVID started, I, I did get a request um, before they place an order, they will ask, what is your uh, protocol for COVID-19? How many right. steps? That's yeah, how does that work? Yeah, working in the kitchen. Um, you know, are you licensed? They have your pass. Has a inspection. Do you wear a mask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So everybody's aware of it. Um, it it can be a tricky business to begin with because we have to take care of the food safety before anything. Now, on top of it, we have to add this uh, COVID nineteen health protocol. So a lot of companies are working with uh, minimum staff just to avoid any unknown person coming in and handle the food. And uh, another change that I notice is everybody asks for individually packed food. Because sometimes when you have eight passengers, it's easier uh, for the pilots or flight attendants to just right. have it one tray. Now they, uh, there are a lot of requests saying, I would like everything to be packed individual. So one time I had uh, a request that was, 20 boiled eggs and she wanted to cut in half individually wrapped and then i was like okay i can do that and then she sent me another email and said oh by the way can you make it pretty so i had to <laughs> put a bow on everything that took a lot of time but at least people are conscious about it and then once everything is done uh we have a very strict strict regulation as to how we deliver the food right. the temperature has to be maintained um in a cold storage um temperature uh by uh, uh regulated by the local health department so we deliver it and as soon, uh, and as soon as we get to the fbo we put it in the refrigerator and from that point uh usually a lot of flight crew will order food maybe an hour prior to their show time or on their show time because they still have some hours. So, so a critical aspect of it is coordinating, coordinating with operations, coordinating with the pilot. And you, you've dealt with both sides, you, with the airline and with corporate mm-hmm. aviation. What advice would you, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to, to chime in with that too, Tamara and Nancy, what advice would you guys have for, for Jacob and Andreas about when they become a professional pilot, they become a corporate or an airline pilot. Um, what advice would you give them uh, as, as pilots as to how to address things like a, a catering? Well, I spent uh, years in the commercial aviation. So the significant difference when it comes to catering between the corporate aviation and commercial is in commercial, uh, in commercial um, airlines, Every flight has a set uh, catering menu. So if you're going from, let's say, Washington dollars to New York, um, it, it, you may not get anything because it's only like 40 minute flight. Right. But if you're going to uh, um, San Francisco or LA from dollars, then per month, they have a set menu. Okay, first class gets this, uh, coach gets this, and the cruise, your option is this, this, this. 
So it's usually uh, chicken, of course, <laughs> before vegetarian, and you get to choose. And you don't right. get that notice in advance. You will find out when you come on board. So usually your flight attendant will tell you, okay, today's menu is this. Which one would you like? And then they start fight because they both want the same thing. <laughs> no, they don't. But um, but that's how the corp. You're uh, joking, but that pro that probably does happen <laughs> from time to time. That's how usually commercial aviation um arrange their crew meal, and the portion is different. is is an airline portion. Uh, whereas in corporate aviation, uh, a lot of times for Part Ninety One operators, um, crew member will have a choice of what they would like to have it just has to meet certain budget because uh it, it is never good to waste money no matter whose money it is so uh, cr most of crewmers are very aware of it and even the corporate aviation we do have a set crew meal but a lot of times if you will just say hey i would like this one but this is for crew then a lot of times they will give you a slight discount because it's for the crew member yeah. Um, Nancy, speaking of crew, <laughs> how about your perspective on, on catering and, and how it affects pilots? Well, uh, catering is, is so essential. And I do love to eat. And it is very important to your ability to fly an airplane to be uh, well fed. Uh, so for crew members, um, you know, whether we order uh, the catering ourselves as pilots, whether we're not flying with a flight attendant that day or we are blessed to have a flight attendant with us who is taking care of the passenger order as well as the crew. Uh, it's just a really essential um, part of flying, particularly in business aviation. Um, as many people probably know or don't know, uh, you know, in business aviation, people really are using their aircraft as a business tool. And uh, they're using it to, to meetings sometimes in several cities and they're super busy and coming aboard and, um, you know, being able to have a great meal that's uh, already on board for them and ready to go is essential. And same thing with the crew. Um, some of these airplanes that are out there now are very long range and uh, you might be eating all three meals of the day on board. Um, so I've seen it done multiple ways. Um, Tamara and I were fortunate enough to fly a trip together last year where she was the flight attendant and took care of everything. Um, and I've been in many operations where as the pilot, we, uh, we order the food and you know, make sure it's what the uh, passengers want. Um, and I just like to add listening to Young and Tamara is a lot of people out there hear the term CRM, crew resource management. And as I was listening to the two ladies talk, I thought to myself, you know, one of the things when you do have a flight attendant or even another pilot with you is, you know, the CRM doesn't take place just in the airplane. It takes place before the trip. And when we have a contract flight attendant um, like Tamara on board, uh, she usually comes out the day before, looks over the aircraft, all the safety items, we go over what the passengers like. And so planning that catering for the trip uh, really does start well in advance, just to make sure it's done perfectly and uh, can be well prepared on board. So it's a very critical part of uh, flying. And it's gonna make or break your trip. You, you can have the best landings and it could be a 10 day trip, but I'll tell you it's, tested. I test it every time I fly on a 10 day trip. Even the pilots, they only remember your last meal. And that has to be your best meal all the time because nobody else can remember it. But your passengers, it's like us when we go to a hotel or a restaurant or we come home. We like that comfort. We like that familiar feeling. And your customers that get on the plane, they want that same feeling. And you can have the best take off and landings. And yes, we're there for safety, but you know what? Those customers want that comfort level too. And when they're showcasing their guests on board and they're doing the business, you got to take in the cultures and everything else that's part of all of that because that makes or breaks a business deal. If you don't do their teas right or something you offend, something so there's a lot of internet parts to that and i think uh this time has changed a little bit of trend uh because this subject 
can sound irrelevant to uh, pilots function, but lately I heard a lot uh, from my pilot friends where they have to go pick up the food because the owner, now he doesn't want any uh, flight attendants or any guest. So he's putting all the trust onto the pilot. So uh, you have to go out and source the food, whether it's a restaurant or a catering company. So in a, in a harsh time, it's a very unique um, challenge that pilots may face if they haven't had the chance to uh, put some interest in catering area. And then they lose sight of the real fact. We're here, uh, a pilot, which Nancy may know, I flew with, they're asking the need of a, the flight attendant. And I love his theory because he said, there's two things as we're crossing the pond or crossing, say we're flying to Europe. He said, if you were to have a heart attack or we are in an emergency, he said, our primary job and say the owners or customers were to have kids. He goes, our job is to get the plane down safely. Yeah. He goes, you want that flight attendant there to help get you down safely and make sure you're secure. He goes, so what would you like? Especially if you were to have kids on board, he goes, ah, let's have that flight attendant on board. So having that third person, you know, however anybody wants to look at it is just having that extra safety. And a lot of times people don't look at it that way because they're looking at the food, but it's, you know, it's the whole concept of making that's your business. That's your office. Uh, Jacob and Andreas, let me shift gears a little bit and, and ask either one of or both of you uh, a question. So when you first got into aviation and, and started uh, going to Embry-Riddle, what was the difference between your initial perspective about the industry and where you are now? Either one of you guys. I'll, I'll go. So when I came to Embry-Riddle, I had zero flight experience. I took one discovery flight. Uh, somewhere in high school, um, to, that's where I kind of confirmed the bug that I wanted to fly. Um, and when I came to Riddle, it was kind of more, they drive a lot of just airline flight instructing to the airlines. And then as I kind of progressed, and especially after getting the Hoover scholarship and going to these conferences and meeting all these people, I had no idea the amount of things that pilots could do. I mean, if you think about every big company, they need a plane and they need a pilot. Uh, the banners getting towed, the crop fields that need crop dusting. It's just, just a huge laundry list of stuff that pilots need to do. And that kind of opened my eyes and then into the corporate world. I had a little bit of experience with that. So um, it kind of shifted from airline to everything. I mean, airplanes are everywhere and aviation is in every business. So there's just an endless amount of things that you can do in aviation. Andreas, how about you? Um, for me, the biggest thing, I'm like very goal driven. So I like to have goals done by a certain time. And I learned with aviation, you can't sometimes have that, um, flexibility. Um, just when I started, I needed, I wanted to get each course done by a certain time and there's the path maintenance, there's weather delays and everything tied up. And I realized, okay, I have to be more flexible about it. I can't say I'm going to finish this course by this date because it probably won't happen. Um, so that's a big thing I learned and kind of echoing what Jacob said, um, going into Embry-Riddle, I was very just thinking about aviation and the only aspect of aviation is the airlines. Um, so just like Bob Hoover scholarship and all these different avenues and people sometimes just have their own airplanes just to fly, um, which is sometimes forgotten in Embry-Riddle, I feel like. Um, because you're so standardized and do everything by the book sometimes, which is good, but you also need to have that fun aspect. So when I left to do my uh, flight instructor training, um, I did it outside the Riddle environment, and I did it at, at FBO, a pretty big one in Reno, Nevada, um, Atlantic. And the amount of different types of aviation that go in and out of the FBO is crazy. You see um, small little airplanes for, um, people that just want to go get breakfast sometimes on the weekend and you have military airplanes, you have, um, a mayor flight where they're transporting all kinds of medical supplies to, uh, military. So there's a lot of different aspects of the aviation that I didn't realize, um, and especially that business, um, aspect. So that's why I'm always keeping my, um, uh, ears open to, um, the corporate side as well. 
to see if, um, if I want to go that route um, instead of the airlines. Yeah, you guys bring up a couple of really good points. Variety is one of them. Flexibility. I'm sure that everybody on this call will agree with me that flexibility and aviation go hand in hand. Um, you, you never quite know uh, what your schedule, how your schedule is going to end up. So you can, you can have things planned out and think that you're, you got a flight tomorrow morning. It's, it's scheduled to depart at seven. You know, you're going to go in and pre-flight set everything up. And then you get that call at, you know, six or, or five in the morning saying up, oh, not leaving till nine. And by the way, we're not going here. We're going there. And by the way, we're carrying two more people and, you know, or we're picking up somebody on the way and all of those type of things. Nancy, you know, Tamara, Young, I'm sure you guys can all agree with me and chime in about that. Yes, I think you need to be uh, ready for anything. I could address a little bit uh, what Tamara and I did in the 99th Airlift Squadron at Andrews is we did have a uh, aircraft that was always on a standby for any kind of government mission that came down. And a lot of flight departments in the corporate world are like that too. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't think you're flying or you're a charter pilot, maybe a charter comes down, you have to be ready to fly, which kind of ties back in with our earlier conversation about these times now, maybe when you're not flying, is the time to stay in the books and, and, and think about flying, uh, you know, to not get rusty. But same thing when you have those standby duties, you have to be ready, you have to have your bag packed, um, you have to be mentally prepared, you know, for a quick drop down trip. And some of the, th the things that we did in the 99th, I mean, you'd be on your alert duty and you'd get the call to go to Russia in a couple hours. Or one morning I got the call to go to Switzerland in two hours. So, wow. uh, but you know what, there's nothing more exciting. And um, if you're mentally ready and, and you've got your studying done and you're ready to fly the plane, it's, it's, it's easy and it's fun. Yeah, yeah. I see a, yeah. So with Nancy and I, I, I see the pilots when they get ready to retire, you know, coming out of the 89th or the military and you'll see half go into the commercial side and the other half go into business. And what you see is some of them, they're like, I just want to push the throttle up, land, go home. And the others they are like, I like that challenge. I like that change. Because in the corporate world, you're going to get changes and the challenges. And I agree with them because I, you just like to know that you have to be flexible, but you never know. You'll get a new challenge, a new change every day. And it keeps you on your toes. And you can say, yep, I'm in Switzerland. And then we come back and we tell a funny story of like, wow, that was challenging or fun or, you know, unique. And I learned something new. Yeah. yeah, I think even in the commercial airlines, uh, you do have that unpredictable schedule when you're on reserve, when you're new hire uh, until your probation period, you will be in, um, on reserve. And sometimes you will sit at the airport for eight hours and sometimes you're going to Hawaii. Uh, but the, the key point is to have your pack uh, bag packed and ready to go. So whether it is commercial, commercial or uh, corporate, that excitement of going somewhere that you didn't expect it, it comes to you and that, i think that's the very exhilarating part of this uh a job being a crew member that you it's thrown to you and you're like so excited about it and you just go for it with the excitement yeah for so the common denominator for all of it is is to actually be prepared um yeah. <laughs> and always be prepared never knowing quite and that also goes, I think, for all for for you, Andreas and and uh, Jacob. I think that goes for your careers, as you progress towards what you want to do. You never know when you're going to get that phone call or that email or that text saying, "Hey, I want you to come in," uh, or or that in your networking, you run into somebody and they say, "What are you doing?" And you tell them, and they say, "Oh." Uh, you know what, uh, why don't you give me a call Monday and, and let's talk a little bit more about that. You don't know when those things are going to happen. So preparation uh, is, a, is a mainstay. But you can also, I like to say, when Nancy and I have talked before, when you feel like everything's going crazy at home, you just want to get out and fly because that's the one place in the world you feel it's calm. I know that. But you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> 
completely agree with you. So just imagine, you know, this time will pass uh, one way or another. Um, all the crisis, like 911, financial crisis, it all passed. But I think at the end of a tunnel, what a lot of companies are seeking is somebody who uh, continue to develop themselves uh, during this you know, void time. And everybody will look at the resume and say, oh, 2020, okay, yeah, I understand. And they, they will be... They will, I, I think they will be the norm and what you do and what which activity uh, in the webinars or network really they participate, uh, participate, they will speak value when uh, somebody actually start reviewing your resume and say, wow, this person kept going. I think that they will be an important part. Yeah. Andreas and Jacob, do you guys have, uh, I think each one of you had another question or, or maybe it's been answered during this conversation. Yeah, I had another question for uh, for Young, but it kind of got an answer. I was just wondering how her operation was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and kind of how she had to alter her onboard service. Because I know I've done a couple commercial flights during the pandemic and they stopped their onboard service or altered it and they do it a little bit different. But you, you pretty much touched on it pretty well. Individual packaging and wearing masks and people already asking about it. Oh, yeah. And another thing is that well, I, I, you know, I mentioned it before, but a lot of um, aircrafts, uh, I do, I, I don't uh, cater to commercial aviation. So I, I'm more focused on the uh, Part 91 or charter flights. But um, like I said, I, I've seen the rise of COVID-19 in China. Um, I had a catering company in Korea and my main clientele were Chinese clientele. And I saw them just stop flying in the middle of day. And it lasted for about three months. And I knew it, it was in, in inevitable. It will develop to be a pandemic. So that's when the panic said, you're like, oh my God, I had all these plans, but nothing will happen. So I had to think whatever I could think the best at the time. And uh, my solution to my own problem was to open another business during the pandemic, but change a concept of business. So I may not have a company in Korea, but now I have a, a catering service in Washington DC area, but now I have to stay competitive. And, you know, I've been flying out of Dallas area in past decades. So I was actually the, the client of most catering companies. So I changed the concept of business from conventional catering company to private chef service. So now I get to, uh, and it, it, it kind of fits the situation because everybody's working with a reduced uh, number of staff and I only take care of one flight a day or whatever I can handle. But the uh, utmost attention will be applied to each order. So I could sit at home and cry and say, oh my God, my life is ruined. But you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, one door closed, another one open. So this may seem like a doomsday to you, but there are a lot of things you can do in the same situation. And sometimes you know, you know yourself best, so you know your talent and the situation that's given to you. As negative as it is, how you turn this negative timeline into positive, there will be a, a valuable quality of all uh, major airlines or any operation will look for. You know, one of the things that we talk about, thank you uh, very much, Young. One of the things we talk about a lot uh, are is we look at things from a domestic uh, U.S. standpoint. But mm -hmm. I know that you guys have all had uh, a, a lot of international experience. Is there any advice that you can share with Andreas and Jacob about flying internationally or, or, or even considering flying for another airline outside of the U.S.? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been a, a known fact that there will be a severe shortage of pilot, and this may, may have a better feedback on this one, but I, I am in very close, um, uh, I have a lot of input in the friends and networks in Asia. There, there, it's been a known fact there has been a shortage of pilots uh, in past decade, I believe. And they're always short of pilots and they welcome the American pilots or European pilots, and they do treat you very well. Uh, those airlines are currently also 
uh, suffering, but the chances are um, if they will have to come back and rehire some people. It may not the desirable uh, company that you would like to work for but overseas looking into overseas companies foreign companies i i i may they may be a very good option for you because they do treat uh, the commercial pilots especially they, they do treat them very well hong kong singapore japan they seems to be back on their feet already the progress they made in uh, aviation uh, especially the corporate aviation they are making a steady progress so they are but then again they had it three months before we had it in states so they're always going to be three months ahead of us so i would say yeah keep your eyes in asia or europe or other countries who got over the pandemic relatively well and if you just see their pattern it I would I would expect that that will be similar to what we will have in the future as to how we get over this hurdle. And Nancy, how about you? Uh, yes, I have a few um, interesting things I just thought of, uh, Vince. Which when you hear other people th talk, everything comes to your mind. Um, yes, you know, before all this, the, the shortage was looming very large. So once everything gets back on the feet on, on its feet, the shortage will be back, and they'll need a, a lot of pilots. Um, let's also not forget, because I don't know who's listening, that um, largely overlooked is the shortage of future mechanics as well. And yes. we cannot fly our airplane without a great mechanic. You just can't do it. Um, so uh, for anyone listening out there, I, I do know some pilots who also have their AMP, their uh, airframe power uh, license. Um, so that's an option as well. And then another thing I just might throw out uh, for the young gentleman and anyone else listening is I'm not currently of what opportunities there might be in guard units or reserve units for a part-time positions and those types of things where maybe you're not flying an airplane right now, but you're doing other things related to aviation. So that's another path uh, you can take as well and may lead to being a, a military guard or reserve pilot or even looking at um, active duty. So there are uh, a lot of great opportunities out there. Yeah, no, that, those are really great points. I, I think it I'm glad you brought up the AMP air, airframe and power plant mechanic. Uh, I actually have talked to a couple of the uh, MROs, uh, the maintenance companies, uh, about that recently. And in fact, we had one. Um, West Star Aviation was on a, on a, a couple of shows ago, and that was one of the things he brought up. That in spite of what we're dealing with with COVID nineteen, uh, uh, the current situation uh, that uh, within aviation that as this pass passes and we start to get back to some form of normal, it will go back up to, and they're actually currently looking for uh, AMP. Yeah, not just them, uh, really everybody is. Uh, that there's, there's, there's definitely a shortage in a lot of areas of aviation, including besides pilots, AMP uh, and uh, avionics uh, technicians and things like that. Um, and, and that's in both commercial uh, and corporate. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of great opportunities out there. Um, and uh, we'll just have to wait it out a little bit. Jacob, have you and Andreas, have you guys had conversations uh, at your schools or flight departments or I mean, I mean flight training or whatever about uh, the various opportunities out there? um for me personally um are you asking about like the school or just among like co-workers uh either one um i i mean amongst co-workers and other friends and uh, family you're always talking about future opportunities and um i've had several friends that went into the airlines right before the pandemic and they were right in the middle of their training um and they got sent home so um, I'm very aware of what's going on with the airlines, with corporate. Um, I haven't spoke to too much um, with others about it, but um, just when I was at the FBO in Reno, you could tell the corporate really died off. When I came back in the flight school at the end of April, it was completely dead. And by the time I left here, um, end of July, it seemed like things were picking back up. So, um, and the same thing with the airlines as well. Gotcha. Jacob? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit at school, and I have a couple mentors that I talk to uh, kind of frequently in the airline industry, um, and then people that I've met at school. 
Um, I know some people are pursuing other backup careers right now during the pandemic. Uh, for example, real estate from a guy from Delta doing other things. But uh, I mean, there's just an endless amount of possibilities out there to keep going. So like all the uh, panelists said, just one door closes, another one opens. You got to keep your eyes open. So that's kind of what we're doing. And we'll just overcome and adapt and stay flexible and just kind of ride it out and hope it gets better. Great. Well, this has been a great conversation. We're going to kind of wrap things up, but I'd like to give uh, you know, young Nancy and, and Tamara an opportunity to uh, make a closing uh, comment about their advice to you guys. Thank you for having me here today. It was my pleasure and best luck to you. Thank you very much, Young. It was great to have you on. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, um, Sethan. Always think, what are your strengths? Find your niche because you got multiple strengths and always have a backup plan and look at all your options and take them in consideration and how you can apply them. You'll do, you'll, you'll do great out there. Yeah, we have, have an extra minute or so. Uh, Tamara, you want to uh, mention again the, the FAA resources you were talking about at the top of the show? Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you just look up FAA courses, the, there's multiple, but you have air traffic control, um, avionics mechanic, airport manager, transportation security screener, airfield ops specialist, aeronautical engineer and safety investigations. Oh, Any of those <laughs> investigations. <laughs> I mean, those are good to know, especially for any type of accidents to know the processes. Absolutely. And Nancy? Yeah, it was great uh, to be with you today and to share experiences and to hear uh, the young graduates uh, talking about their, their plans and, and what they're thinking of. I'm sitting here doing a little math thinking, oh, I had my first uh, flight in a Cessna 150 coming up on 38 years ago. And um, I wouldn't have missed this career for the world. I think there's fantastic people in aviation. Um, it's so high tech, it's so forward looking. Um, it, it, it's just a great industry. So stick with it, uh, it'll come back. And like we discussed, always be prepared, be ready uh, to do whatever is asked of you and always pursue excellence. It is a career that demands nothing less than being perfect and excellent. And um, I think that's one of the things that's great about it too makes it very challenging as the ladies mentioned earlier, but you've got to do your job perfectly and uh, that's what you've got to be ready for. I would like to add a final note to, to you guys. Uh, when 911 happened, I was working at the airline. I was working for American and you can imagine what happened to me or my friends and to the pilots. It was extremely tough, but I, I would like you to know your greatest asset um, is your youth. I was in my 20s, I was in my, you know, I, I thought the sky was gonna fall and I was gonna die, but I, I just want, I, I wish you realized what a great asset you had. You just being you um, at that age, you'll be able to get over a lot of things. So just, uh, I wish you the best luck. Thank you very much, Young. So Jacob and Andreas, I hope you guys uh, got some uh, tips out of this today uh, and, and found value in the information that was shared. Yeah, thank you, Vince, and thanks to all the panelists for, uh, for having me on here. This is this is what it's all about. This is what I love about aviation, all the mentorship and people that are so willing to help uh, the up-and-comers in aviation. So this is what it's all about, getting people talking. It's how we'll all get through us. So thanks again, Vince, and thanks to everyone for coming on. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. It was a real pleasure to be on here and to hear all the different aspects of aviation and to continue building that knowledge and just makes me excited to go out there and get to work and and just have fun in life with aviation and i just appreciate the opportunity well this has been great to have you guys uh, tamara young nancy thank you guys for taking time out of your schedules to uh share this information and join us on this webcast uh, again this is all things aviation which is uh, uh brought you know on behalf of the bob hoover legacy foundation uh, the president is Tracy Forrest, uh, the chairman, uh, Mike Herman, and the board of uh, the, the board of directors for the foundation. And it's a relatively new initiative. And uh, the goal is to do just what the conversation we had today, which is to uh, provide advice and insight on how to further their careers. 
in terms of these uh, aspiring young aviation professionals and also encourage those who are watching uh, that may be interested in aviation, uh, what the options are and how you can get started with it and that type of thing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Jacob and Andreas are, are two of uh, actually 34 um, uh, Bob Hoover Legacy Presidential Scholarship recipients, and uh, which was provided by the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation and the Citation Jet Pilots Association. It's a, it's a program that we want to continue to expand and provide opportunities for more. Uh, every time we talk to these, uh, these young professionals, uh, they, they tell us how valuable it was, not only in receiving the scholarship to help with paying for their education, but also the exposure that they have had to uh, aviation in, in terms of uh, things like the Citation Jet Pilots Association uh, type, type club and, and uh, Oshkosh uh, Air Venture, which was virtual this year, uh, NBAA's uh, annual convention, uh, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot of things that we hope to continue to provide uh, by having a guest. And, and most importantly, that yes, there are plenty of options to be a pilot uh, and, and different types of pilots, whether it's commercial, corporate, uh, humanitarian, um, uh, et cetera. But uh, there are also so many other things in this industry uh, that are applicable as well. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for watching. And thank you guys for, for being on the show today. Everybody have a good one. Thank you.